Good morning, everyone. I do lots of weddings, and yesterday uh, I was in Franschhoek at La Brie. Now, I don't know if you know La Brie. It's a very nice wine estate. Uh, a, a, a couple there, English, but who've settled in, in Franschhoek. And it seemed that half of the United Kingdom was there, um, which was lovely. Franschhoek was, was lovely, and, and everything was just as it ought to be. Um, at the appointed hour, or the appointed half hour, half past eight, the music began. And uh, the bride began her long walk to freedom. <laughs> That's how I like to see it, you know. It really is just the most wonderful thing. Marriage is just a wonderful thing, from singleness to this wonderful, wonderful uh, position in your life to share your life with, with someone. As the music started and the bride appeared, and she really did look gorgeous, the groom moved over to me. He moved over to me. And he leaned his head over to me and said, James, is there one last word of advice? <laughs> that, that's no word of exaggeration. It's never happened before. <laughs> I've had one guy at the point of, of, as his bride, he stepped forward and took a selfie of himself <laughs> like that. That was unusual, but he just sort of sidled over to me and said, James, is there one last word of advice that you would like to give me? Now, I was, you know, I mean, she's coming down the aisle, for goodness sake. And so you probably want to know what I said to him, and I really didn't practice it. I hadn't even really thought through it, but I did say this. I said, Joe, immerse yourself in this moment. Immerse yourself in this moment. Because it is an incredible moment. It's a huge moment. It is a beautiful moment in any man, in any woman's life. I've always said it's the second most important day after their birthday. Immerse yourself in this moment. I want you today to immerse yourself in being here. You're not to be an audience kind of watching James Gray doing his thing. It's not about it. You, you are not an audience. You are not detached from what is happening here. We are together participants in this unfolding hour in the presence of God. Now that is a, an appropriate song for us to sing in the light of our reading this morning, which is the third story in the trilogy that Jesus speaks in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. You, you remember, and we've been doing this in the past few weeks, Jesus spent a lot of time interacting, befriending people who, who many people in that society in those days looked down upon. They were just very straightforward people. A lot of them with like all of us, lots of faults, lots of faults. And there were those who, who kind of imagined themselves as, okay, we are respectable people. We never do anything really bad. And now Jesus is seen spending more time than these others would like him to with those who were perhaps on the margins. And the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious people of those days grumbled, we are told. And Jesus hears them grumbling. 
And he tells those three stories. One about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and one goes missing. And he leaves the 99 out in the wilderness. He takes this huge risk, and he goes out in search of that sheep. And we read, until he finds it. The determination of that shepherd, putting his, putting his life at risk, putting even the flock's safety at risk. But the scripture says he goes after it. He goes after it. And you can just sort of sense the determination of that shepherd. I am going to find that sheep. And he finds the sheep, places it on his shoulder, returns to the fold, calls his friends and neighbors together, rejoice with me. And there is this great celebration. And Jesus goes on to say, I, I tell you, in, in, in a similar way, there is more rejoicing in heaven than over, over the one that is found, than over 99 people who think, I'm okay, I'm okay. That's story number one. And then number two is the woman who had the 10 silver coins, very precious coins, probably, probably used to form the basis of a veil that would be used on, on her wedding day. And it was always a, a great treasure. It was something every young girl would spend a great deal of her time saving up for and making it with these 10 beautiful, not pure silver coins, but they looked silver. And now calamity. She's probably been working with this, and one falls off and is nowhere to be found. And she looks, and she looks, and she looks. Because the houses in those days were very dark. One small window, a lot of dust, a lot of reeds, but she looks until she finds it. And finding it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, and they have this celebration. And I tell you, says Jesus, there is more rejoicing among the angels of heaven, in the presence of the angel of he in heaven, over that one Coin. You can imagine, I mean, this picture of sheer joy, kind of high-fiving. We've got it. We, you know, he, her, is home. Look, Gray has, is back where he belongs. And you can put yourself into that picture. I hope you do. I hope you do. That's how we're supposed to read the Bible. Sometimes we come to the Bible as students, you know, to study the Bible, to learn but actually, the Bible is, a f Bible f is a book full of drama. And you must position yourself somewhere in these stories. That's how we get the most out of the Bible. Not by reading it dispassionately, arm's length, but by saying, who am I in this story? And then there's a third story. So we've got a shepherd. God is compared to a shepherd who's out there looking. Or God is compared to a woman out there looking for a coin. And now the third, probably the, the most famous story that Jesus ever told, although some might say, no, it should be the Samaritan or it should be this or whatever. Certainly, this is my favorite story in the Bible. And Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that. The younger son gathered all his possessions together and set off for a distant country where he squandered his wealth in wild 
living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired men. And so he set out and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on him and flung his arms around him and kissed him. And the boy said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Quick, said the father, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost. And is found. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that is just, there's no other story like it. And I hope you put yourself somewhere in that story. Now, you know the story goes on. I want to talk about that part next Sunday. I've always been very interested that at the funeral of Sir Harry Oppenheimer, who died uh, many years ago, remember Harry Oppenheimer, Anglo American? He asked for this shortened version of the prodigal son to be read. Just this first bit. Now, doubtless, there were eyebrows raised because this is a boy who tossed his life away. I mean, at one level, it is a It is a very unfortunate story, and we probably say, oh, well, you know, thank you, Lord, that, you know, I've been there and done that. Well, no less than Oppenheimer himself asked for this first portion of the parable of the prodigal son. And we read it at Fiona's funeral. And a couple of people said, well, when I first sat down in the church and looked at it and saw that reading, I thought, my goodness, that's hardly the kind of reading you want to place for your wife's funeral. Well, I would hope that when my time comes and we have a service here, we will also read the first portion of the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter because there are certain paintings out there that depict not a prodigal son returning to his father but a prodigal daughter This is why I say, put yourself in the story. Um, Some people will say it's it's over the top. It's over the top. How, How can a father be so lavish, so almost overpoweringly gracious and loving to a son that has so dishonored his father, dishonored himself, and dishonored his community and his religion. But that's part of the power of this amazing, amazing story. We're going to sing just now 
the song Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that what? Saved a respectable person like me? I know. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet that sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. Look at me. Look at where I was. And we know, we know, dear, dear friends, that in our lives there have been times when we have lost our way completely. And what would God do if he was God of pure justice? You remember the story of that lady who stood in front of a portrait artist? She was a very prim and very fine lady, and she was wearing all her finery, and she said to the artist now, as he stood there at his easel looking at her, and he said, she said to him, young man, I want you to do me justice. And he looked at her and said, ma'am, it's not justice, but mercy that you require. <laughs> Now, what, what if? I mean, come on. What if it was God of pure, pure, undiluted, severe justice? Boom. No. 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 That's why John Newton, the hymn writer, looking at his life, just says, amazing grace. You know what I deserve? You know, I have messed up, gone all down all manner of dead ends. You know what I deserve? I don't want to begin to tell you what I deserve, but I choose not to look at what I deserve, but a loving father who's been waiting, waiting for his son, his daughter to come home. And think of that, just where he's been, the fine home, clearly a prosperous home. Think of, of all that has happened and that decision. And, and let's not criticize him because let me tell you, none of us have, have a, an empty cupboard. We've all made poor decisions, poor decisions that have taken us down roads that we profoundly and deeply regret. And you can picture that boy kind of full of himself. Oh, you know, like, I'm so glad. I'm kind of, you can stay as you are for the rest of your life, or you can change to mainstay. You know, all that rubbish. <laughs> you know, whoosh. The yachts and all that sort of, you know, that advert that used to come there. That's going back a few years. And how we just further and further and further away. And one of the stories I was brought up as a boy was a story that, that came from my Scottish mother. They used to tell me this, and it always used to move me almost to tears, though not quite of this, this old Presbyterian home out there in the highlands of Scotland and this restless young daughter, this restless young daughter who, who, this is too narrow, this is too quiet, it's not how she wants to live her life, so she breaks away and goes off down to London. And, and I guess it's a sort of a story not unlike this, Luke 15. And uh, there comes a moment when she remembers, she remembers. And so she starts the journey home, back this broken, broken girl, back to, to the highlands, and, and kind of knocks on the door, wondering whether her, her, her old father is going to welcome her in. But what he had done, and it's not like the story he had not heard, or he had heard, rather, he had heard all these sort of rumors coming from 
London from people who'd down there had seen her, that he'd got his old family Bible out, the old family Bible where all the people had written, and he had got and he'd erased his daughter's name. And, and this, this story climaxes in this girl coming home and the encounter between the father and how she goes over to the family Bible and opens it and sees that her name has been erased. But then the great moment is when the father puts his dear, dear daughter. But the difference between that story and, of course, our story is that your name has never been erased. Our names have not been erased. Because you belong to him, friends. You belong to him. And whilst we may have to have our names erased, blotted out, Thanks be to God that he does not treat us according to what we deserve, but according to the abundant riches of his love and grace and mercy. And how did it all happen? He's, he's there out in the fields longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. And then he came to his senses. Came to his senses. Now, what exactly happened? We don't, we don't know. We don't really need to know. Was there, a, was there something that happened that suddenly triggered everything? I, I call this moment the, the moment of memory when he thought back upon his childhood. And as he thought back on his childhood, this whole past came back to him. And he compared where he had been and how he had experienced his life then to what he was now. And there was just no comparison. And I think if I ever wandered far, far away from God, do you know what would bring me back? It would be some of the old hymns and songs that I was brought up on that would suddenly trigger something, and I would know there was a time when my heart was happy. Yes, I may have been young and, and thought as a child, but my heart was happy and secure and safe. And it's the gift of memory as you think back, think back, think back, and Maybe he thinks, you know, how many pictures, the farm, how many, how many of my father's hired men have food? He probably saw them being given this food at the end of a day's work and going off to their cottages and there having hearty meals with the wife and the children gathered. And here I am, starving to death. The gift of memory. We've been here often and sung a hymn. How about that one? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. You know? I was brought up on that one. I wanted to sing that one because this is, I kind of imagine that boy looking and wondering. And there was the, the call, the call. Something you can't explain. Don't even try and explain, but just the call from afar. This is not where I belong. This is not me. The call, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling to you and to me. Yeah, the call is come home. Come home. You who are weary, come home. Now, I suggested, it was it last week or the week before, then I think one of the reasons why there are older people at United, and there's nothing wrong with that. It seems to be a source of criticism, constant criticism, all the old people go to United. It doesn't worry me in the slightest. But I think one of the reasons is because the noise has settled. 
the noise and the thump and the beat and the tw- it's all been tw- the fast life and the ambition and the striving. Tw- and the older we get, it quietens down a little bit. It quietens down. And we can hear a call softly and tenderly. And at this stage of our lives, we're more open not only to hearing that call, but responding to it softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. As I said to that guy yesterday, Joe, immerse yourself in this moment. Is there someone calling you? Perhaps there is. And we'll take communion, sharing communion. That's an opportunity for us to respond. But I also, as I read this, and I only noticed this for the first time the other day, that something has happened in this boy. Something has happened from that youngster who says, Dad, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the estate amongst them and off he goes. And hear what he said. He said, Father, give me. It's give me. It's a sort of a, an entitlement. Give me my share. And the father did that, and off he went. When he comes to the feeding of the pigs, and he comes to his senses, and he says, how many of my Father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go to my father, and I will say to him, what? Father, make me. Now, there's a big difference between father, give me the entitlement, give me. And that point in your life where you say, Father, make me. There's a big difference. The one is quite a sort of a low level. It's all about what I can get about. God is the celestial bellboy. I ring the bell and God comes in and says, how can I help you? You know, ask and you, and all that sort of thing. And this is sort of a, God is there to give me, give me, give me. And boy, If it doesn't happen within the time specified, then we turn away embittered and say it's a load of nonsense. To a higher plane where it's not Father, give me, but Father, make me. Here I am. You do with me, Father. You do with me, Father, make me. Now, he asked for, to be made just a hired ma- man. Little did he know what was going to happen, did he? He never really knew because he comes and the father is clearly waiting. He sees him from afar. That's my boy, bedraggled, but I, I recognize the gate. I recognize that walk. Yes, it's a stumbling broken figure, but that is my boy, and he runs for all he is worth, and he flings his arm around him and kisses his boy. You know, that is more than just a physical thing. You put your arms around somebody. You've done that. You've been to the airport or something. I love going to the airport. And watching, for, you know, we're waiting for one of my children because you get quite emotional. People really lose it, and it's beautiful. They run, oh, and that embrace because probably they haven't seen one another for ages. And you think it's just a physical thing? Kind of put your arm around person, hi, good, nice to see you, let's go to the car park. Or is there something? A synergy, something is happening between two people. Uh, it is that, isn't it? You, you, it's love. It, it is love, love, love. I, I did a, a funeral yesterday morning at Fernkloof. 
a very young man, um, Stuart McFarlane, who had motor neuron disease and died. And it was said at the service, I thought it was just a wonderful, wonderfully profound comment. Grief, grief is love with nowhere to go. I thought, oh, that is beautiful. Grief is love with nowhere to go. Well, contrary to that, this joy between the father and his boy, this is love with everywhere to go. It's about my boy. Forget all that has happened. And the boy begins with his confession. Father, he says, whoa, stop. Bring the best robe. Quick, bring the best robe. Not the bathrobe, the best robe. Reserved for honored guests. Did he deserve that? No. Bring the ring, the symbol of sonship. This is not the hired man. This is my son. Sandals on my feet. Dignity. This is no Carl Foot Blonky here. This is a man who is my son. I will treat him as an honored, honored member of my family. Bring the fattened calf already, already, and kill it. Let's have a feast. And celebrate. For this my son who was dead is alive. He was lost and his father. Boy, he didn't expect that. Oh my goodness. He expected. He said, Father, make me like one of your hired men. And he gets treated like this. It's kind of over the top, you would say. But the point is, he said, make me. Make me. And I think when we just place our hands before our lives before God and say, it's not about give me, Lord, it's about make me, make me, make me the person you want me to be. And they had this great feast. And they celebrate. Is that all over the top? Maybe next week you're going to think it was a little bit over the top because that other son thought it was excessive. But the point of the three stories and the shepherd and the, the woman and the, is that this is the heart of God here this morning. And for me, it is my great, Joy, joy in life to be able to speak like this, to open a story like this and say, this is God's word to each one of us today. So how will you respond? How will you respond?